I'm Seth Bongas. I'm the president of Hildeen. Thank you all for coming. When we have these things, we never know whether we're going to get three people or 40 or whatever, but it's, not, we have a, it's nice to have a nice crowd here today, so thank you all for coming. Um, Hildeen's mission is values into action. Three words. Um, values and action. Our core values, which really emanate straight from Lincoln, are integrity, perseverance, and civic responsibility. But having emanated from Lincoln, we now make them our own. Um, the key actions on the action side of values into action are historic preservation, which makes, I think, perfect sense, land conservation, um, 412 acres, civil civic discourse, emanating straight from the notion of civic responsibility, and sustainability, also emanating straight from the concept of civic responsibility. So values into action with those elements. Um, today's program in this series, this four-part series, relates to at least two of those key actions, land conservation and sustainability. Um, <clears throat> for instance, along the lines of sustainability, just this little example, our forest management plan has as its highest priority pollinators. Um, it didn't, we, we had, we used to have wildlife. And we got much more specific about it as we really focused in on um, what's going on in the notion of sustainability and we all know what's happening with the pollinator population and how critical that is to our food chain. And so we've, we've refined everything we're doing here and at least under the actions, that is one of the key things on which we're focused at Hildeen. There's a lot of things we're focused on, but that's one of them. Um, so what's happening here is we are trying, we're working to bring the entire 412 acres to life. We've, as most of you have a sense of, the, on this level, the upper level, the hill, as opposed to the dean, we really have brought between the goat dairy, the Pullman car, the gardens, the house, we've really brought this part of the dean to life. Next is to bring the dean to life, and as you, anybody who's driven down along River Road can see that beginning to happen, where we're, we're working to have a second farm, animals, we have an amazing, Stephanie touched on it, teaching greenhouse that we've completed, actually you could say completed within the last couple of months. <laughs> Part of the Chris. Um, and um, the high school program, where we have high school kids there virtually every day now, and that program is only going to grow with uh, biology, plant and soil science, ecology, and actually economics, and, all, and everything spiritual that can come from that. So a really uh, a high school program added to the elementary and middle school programs that we've had at Hildeen for a long time. So membership, incidentally, um, allows you access to Hildeen at no charge other than the membership itself, 360 days a year. Um, so just before I get to Dave, a couple, one other quick thing is to thank GNAP, uh, Greater North Shore Cable Access. I don't know that doesn't translate to GNAP, but you get the point, <laughs> Cable Access. Um, and really, to, it's worth pointing out the service that they provide. Um, it's as, as, as exemplified by the fact that they're here today and they're going to record all four of these and make them available to a much wider audience. But whether it's co covering select news meetings, planning commission meetings, town meetings, and other ways in which they make um, uh, television available to the public and help keep the public informed about what's going on in this part of the state, they provide a remarkable service. And so thank you to Dina for being here today. <clears throat> um, see. For those of you who paid the $5 to come today, if you would like to translate that into a pass to spend more time here today, <coughs> that will be taken into account if you could. <coughs> okay, now, on to our speaker today, and on to this, um, to this series. Our speaker today is Dave Curtis, um, who is, uh, he has, um, he's been teaching since 1976. He is, in so, half the time, roughly speaking, in Massachusetts before coming to Vermont, where he's now been teaching for 26 years, the last 16 at Burn Burton. Um, he is chair of the science department at Burn Burton. Um, and by the way, he does a great JFK, if I mean, you can do that <laughs> sometime today. Um, but Dave is both, I think what I want to say about Dave is that he's one of those teachers um, who is beloved by his colleagues and everybody and his students, everybody at the school, but at the same time, he's respected. They don't always go together in exactly the way that they should, but in this case, they do. And he's one of those teachers who is able to inspire students to want to work for him, to want to be successful for him. That's the mark of a great teacher. 
Um, and that's what we have today, and you're going to get a little bit of that today. Um, he, among other things, because he's so dedicated, he restarted the track and field, uh, the, the running program at Burn Burton, um, turned in a couple of state championships, a couple of state champions, um, and has revitalized that program. At the same time, he's now become, he's for, since 06, been chair of the science department and breathed serious life into that department. Um, this series about sort of reading the landscape and understanding the landscape you, you don't even know this, Dave, but was inspired by me, in, what, to, this, to this degree, standing outside your classroom one day when you didn't know I was there. And I was with, with somebody taking around the halls, and you, I listened to you, and you were talking about the way the mountains were formed here. And I was fascinated because, of course, we all drive around to see the mountains and the valleys, and never quite occurs to us to say, or at least to me, uh, necessarily, where did they come from? Why are they here? And I listened to him talking about that, and it was so fantastic fantastic goal um, that I was I just stood there in awe and then I started talking to everybody about hearing hearing him talk about that I've been talking about it now and then for a couple of years and that was a little bit of the genesis of this of this series aside from all kinds of other reasons but it was uh, it was uh, it was because of me standing outside your classroom so um, with that um, welcome to uh, so the series by the way is this part today which is sort of the the one, the overarching series about the geography, the ge the geology, and how it how it got to be the way the way it is. Next time, uh, two weeks from today, at ten o'clock, is hydrogeology. Is, is a program about hydrogeology, um, much of which involves what's going on subsurface. And we have one of the one of the I think states very good as I've known them for a long time. Hydrogeologists coming down to do that part and build on what we're doing today. Um, the third one, two weeks after that is our forester, Alan Calfey, uh, also a great, great speaker, great teacher, um, all of these are, so, and um, talking about the forested landscape, why we have the trees, which connects to all kinds of things, of course. It's not just as simple as, well, there's part, of, part of it's the impact of man, part of it's nature, there's part of it's history, there's all kinds of things going on for why you see the kinds of trees we see around here, and the forest that we see. And the last one is our own Andrea McKinney, who's in the back here today, um, who's going to talk about <coughs> soils and why we have the soils we have, um, how they were formed, where they came from, what they grow well, what they don't grow well, and of course, through all of this, the real thread underneath of this is how do we help keep them intact and preserve them and <coughs> follow that thread of sustainability. So um, with that overly long-winded setup, um, Dave, thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. When, when Seth and Stephanie approached me to do this uh, back in December, I said, that sounds like a, a really great idea, but I'm not a geologist. Um, and they, they said, yeah, but we think you could do this. Uh, but OK, but I'm really not a geologist. Uh, and I'm not a geologist. Uh, but I certainly have been a, a student of the land and, uh, and really enjoy this whole approach. Uh, to do in this. My job is as a teacher and I hope what I'm able to do for you is what I hope I've been able to do with my students and that is to inspire you to go on uh, and, and for you to come back and, and teach me a little bit more. Uh, this is a really beautiful land. I didn't grow up here but sure I'm glad I landed here. Um, we see certainly Hill Dean and and Mount Equinox with uh, Cook's Hollow and Skinner's Hollow off there, shaped by many forces that we're going to talk about today. This is an aerial view. And in order for us to do justice to this, uh, we're going to need to answer a couple of questions. So first, I think one of the things that really intrigues me about this whole approach that they've taken is that it reminds me of reading the book Hawaii by James Michener. And, and Michener starts with, with the formation of the Hawaiian Islands geologically. And then he talks about how, you know, people, have, if I remember right, from Bora Bora paddled over and landed and, 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 and how that land affected them. And that's such a cool theme. Uh, and there have been many books written about that. A recent one by a biologist from Calif uh, UCLA named Jared Diamond. It's called Guns, Germs, and Steel, and he talks about how the land affected the people, and certainly the land here has affected us. 
And again, in order for us to get anything, we have to answer a couple of questions. And one of them is this. This here is Manchester. This is the new Route 7. I think Hildeen is down here. Uh, and what we see is we see this side here is this big bank of green. Well, those are the green mountains. And then about 8, 12 miles away, something like that, we have these over here, the Taconic Mountains. So one of the really unique things about this area is that we have these two separate mountain ranges, the Greens to our east and the Taconics to our west. So one of the things we want to try to figure out is their relatedness. Are they related and how? And the other thing that we want to do is this. So uh, I've been here several times kind of walking around and trying to get a feel for the land. Um, and one of the things I did in one of my stops is I went over to the ledge and I stole some rocks from the ledge. And, uh, and, and we don't need to be a geologist to, you know, some a geologist could look at that and say, oh, well, I know what that is. But we can actually do a little test to see what it is. And this is the rocks that come from right over here, an area that uh, is the bowl. And I have some really dilute acid here. You could use vinegar. I just didn't want to then smell it the rest of the morning. Uh, so this here is a dilute type of acid, and we just pour it into our beaker and just give it a second and what we see is something kind of weird and do you see what's going on there? It's dissolving kind of. Kind of is, <laughs> yeah. What we're finding is that then the rocks are giving off gases in this weak acid. There's bubbles coming out of there. And if I were doing this in a seventh grade class, we'd be trapping the gas. And we'd be doing different tests to find out what kind of gas it is. And what we would find is that this here is carbon dioxide. And uh, what, is, what it's coming from is it's coming from calcium carbonate that is in that rock. That rock that's found here, just outside over there, is limestone. Okay, so, and limestone is primarily calcium carbonate. And so, so that gives us a second, second question. How does the rock here become limestone? Because what limestone is, is it's ancient seabeds. That's the only place limestone forms. It's at the bottom of ancient seabeds. So um, the way that you make limestone is you have a sea and you have different living things. This here, plants, animals. When this limestone was formed, weren't a ton of animals. This is microscopic things. This limestone formed around a billion years ago, between 500 million and a billion years ago. So there's no fish, there's no bugs. Single-celled organisms primarily, and one of them uh, is, a, is a group of creatures called a foraminifera. And a foraminifera makes a calcareous or calcium-based skeleton. They live and they die, and they live and they die, and their remnants build up on the bottom, and over hundreds of years, more, over thousands of years, we crush the old stuff down. Over tens of thousands, millions of years, we take that stone and crush it into sedimentary rock, which is limestone. This land that we're standing on used to be at the bottom of a sea. Well, how can that be? We're quite a ways from a sea. Um, so, so those are questions that we're going to have to be able to understand a little bit. Um, Limestone typically is a really good stone for finding fossils. I have found very few fossils in the limestone down here. One of them, one of the reasons for that is because this is before animals for the most part. Okay, so what are you going to find in there? Uh, and the other reason is because the limestone down here has gone through successive crushes and pushes. And when that happens, you lose, uh, you lose the fossils. In fact, if you take limestone and really crush it, you get marble, which is what our valley is pretty famous for. Um, a little further north of where the marble is, up on the shores of Lake Champlain, um, th these are here are, are pieces of limestone that comes from Button Bay, uh, which is up in the Middlebury area. And, uh, these do show a few fossils. We don't get fish, this is pre-fish. What we get is, in this particular case, in these stones, I used to have a really good one, and I lent it to somebody. Yeah, 
So you know what happened to that. Okay, so anyway, uh, in little tiny impressions here are found. They are these animals here, which are called crinoids. So crinoids are still with us today. They're related to uh, uh, starfish and uh, other echinoderms. And when a crinoid dies, usually, this part here usually rots away. But down through here is a little stalk, and it's reinforced with little calcium rings. And those rings fall apart. And you can see evidences of rings in this stone. This is a stone that didn't get crushed as much as this, and it indicates how old this stone is. If you continue to go further up, uh, believe it or not, in the center of Lake Champlain, totally unrelated to Lake Champlain, there are fossils of, there are some of the, this here is actually from Isle, Isle, Isle Lamont. Is that pronounced correctly? Yes. I'm from Boston. Okay, so, um, and this here is a fossilized coral reef a coral reef that's a half a billion years old, up in the middle of Lake Champlain. And, and, and it's in people's backyards. You know, it's right in their backyards, and they're really usually pretty, they're very, very nice. They'll let you go in and look at it, and what have you. So all of this is related, and it's related right on down the line, and it certainly goes south of here as well. So how did we get this way? How did you get seabeds here in Manchester, Vermont? <clears throat> well, to, to, to uh, start with that, we can take a look at this. And this here is a, this here is a di diagram of the Earth. And with a good map, you can clearly see that you know, this here is kind of like the yin of that yang. They kind of fit together like jigsaw puzzles. And as soon as we got good maps, people said, oh my god, they fit together like jigsaw puzzles. And a guy named Alfred Wegener, he's kind of given credit for this, but it predates him. It goes back 60, 70 years. As soon as they got good maps, I know one of the scientists was a guy named Dr. Seuss. Okay, no relation to uh, Cat in the Hat and all that. Uh, but he actually, uh, I know he came up with this idea that, is it possible? And it's not just, I mean, the science doesn't work that way. Is it possible? We have to have evidence. Dr. Seuss actually had some evidence. Wegener improved that evidence. And some of the evidence of this is a series of fossils that we find. So if this land were together, what uh, Dr. Seuss found is he found a little fern called Glossop Glossopterus. And that fossil is found throughout many continents, and his, his idea was that these continents were once together. Wegener added other research. We have other fossils that we see swathed across these continents. And just because we find a fossil of a reptile here in South America and here in Africa doesn't mean that they were connected. But if they were connected, it is evidence that they were connected. The, but when Wegener came up with this idea in the 19, around 1915, people thought he was out of his mind. You know, I, I, really? Okay, and the reason for that is because there was no mechanism. There was no, we didn't understand how things could move around. Well, now we do. And that really exploded in the 1950s. And it exploded through primarily the study in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And what we found then, and still active today, are areas of what we call seafloor spreading. And what happens there is we have, we have volcanic activity. We have rocks that are hot, superheated by the core of the Earth. In fact, this is actually a process of trying to cool the Earth. And, and it sets up giant convection currents in rocks. And we've probably seen convection currents in water, but water and, and rock are certainly got a different density and where water might crook along like this, these here move much, much slower, a centimeter a year or so. And these convection currents come welling up from the deep and they turn and they move. And what they do is they put a force 
on these two areas and they drive them apart. And the liquid rock wells up in between and it actually makes new sea floor. And we, the, this was first discovered in the 50s. Questions were asked, what's going on? And what we find out is that if you date this rock, it's young. This here is a little less young. The oldest rock is over here. So it appears that we have this seafloor spreading. And, and since that time, with more, um, with more uh, tech, uh, uh, technology and what have you, we've been able to map the entire ridge. And what we find is that this seafloor spreading ridge is, is smack dab in the between this. So what's happening is that rock is coming up and pushing these continents apart. So that means a million years ago they were closer together. A million years before that they were closer together. About 200 million years ago they were touching each other. So now we have a mechanism for the way that these continents move. Um, and what we what we have, um, this here is, is sort of like continental drift in one little slide. Over here we have the seafloor spreading, and then what we have is we have this crust meeting that crust. This is oceanic crust, it's a whisker more dense than this crust over here which is called continental crust, so it dives underneath it. It's an area called a subduction zone. <clears throat> and we get the idea that, you know, these rocks just kind of flow across each other like conveyor belts, but they don't do that at all. They jam, and they jam, and then boom, they slip. And when they slip, that's what we have. That's an earthquake. This is a map that I've been keeping next to my room since August, August 27th. And this is a map of all earthquakes that have a, uh, that have a magnitude of 4.0 on the Richter scale or greater. Believe it or not, there's about 10 a day. And if, you were to, if I were to go to 2.5, there'd be 60 or 70 a day. They're just all happening all the time. And what we find is we find that they're not random, that they're located right here. Well, that's where we have these areas where the plates are hitting. And uh, for those of you who are familiar with this, we have uh, not in addition to the movement of crust underneath, as it gets down through here, it starts to heat and expand, and it comes up, and that's where we have our volcanoes. If I, if I charted volcanoes, I would get a pattern similar to this. What's really cool, there's many cool things, but what, what I find to be absolutely fantastic, I, I actually try to have my students figure this out. If we look at this, um, it, we can pick any area right in here. If you have an earthquake that's close to the ocean plate, it's very shallow. Yet as you go in, if you have an earthquake that's further inland, it's very deep. And that's because if it's out here towards the ocean, the slip is occurring here. Whereas if it occurs, if it occurs uh, further inland, the slip is over here, much, much deeper. So all of these data and all these ideas give us a mechanism for the movement of these plates. And, and that's what we have. And what this shows is exactly this. These here are the major plates on Earth. And here is where we have seafloor spreading. These guys are going that way, that way. And what's happening is, although the seafloor is spreading, the earth doesn't get bigger. So somewhere it's got to get, be destroyed. And it gets destroyed in these areas where a continental piece is, is, is overriding an oceanic piece. So the size of the earth stays the same. And we continually recycle rocks uh, through our earth. So most everybody has heard of Pangaea. Pangaea is where all the continents were once together. And Pangaea, Pangaea occurred about 200 million years ago. Well, the Earth is 4.6 billion years old. So what happened before Pangaea? Well, they were moving around again. So in order for us to understand the mountains here, we actually have to go way before Pangaea. Okay, so we need to go way back. And the first one we're going to look at, and this has nothing to do with these mountains directly, but it's cool. OK. This here is about a billion years ago. Even before that, 
So real long time ago. And all of the continents are kind of coming together. And here is the great supercontinent of Laurentia. That's where we are. We are right about here. Notice a couple things. One, here's the equator. Our land was south of the equator. Of course, that's a billion years ago. Okay? I wouldn't mind being south of the equator right about now. Okay? But our land was south of the equator. And these plates are moving so that we think what was happening is that there were, as the plates hit, like today, the India plate is hitting the Euro-Asian plate and lifting up the Himalayas. They get a lot taller every single year. Well, the same thing was happening a billion years ago. And right here, along the whole rim of that supercontinent where we're standing, were quite possibly the tallest mountains that have ever existed on this Earth. We think they were at least as tall as the Himalayas are today, right here. Not a billion years is a long time. So they've been sanded and blasted and eroded away. And there's remnants of them. This is a time that's been called the Glenville Orogeny. Orogeny means mountain building. And, uh, and if you go to the Adirondacks, there are certain spots on the greens up into Canada, you'll see the stumps of these mountains as, as this very, very old, old stone. Okay. What's going to happen here is that these continents are going to come together. And when they do, they actually form Pangaea before Pangaea. Okay, and this happened about 700 million years ago, and it's called Rodinia. And here we have those Grenville Mountains in here, also in here, and these lands are going to come together, and uh, they're going to they're move together. <clears throat> Okay, so they're moving together because of those convection currents that are coming out of the earth and they're driving them. So we talk about the seafloor spreading. It hasn't all, the convection currents can change their position. And over hundreds of millions of years, they do that. Okay, any other questions before we move on? Yo! Um, also, I think that there was this other super continent called Gondwana. Yes, there was. Yeah. Yeah, you bet you. We're going to be talking about that in just a second. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Good job. Yo. Uh, probably just didn't mark them, but why does Baja region not have any earthquakes when it has them above and below on your map? Um, what's that? Uh, uh, that oh, down. yep. Uh, it's just because uh, if I take that for two years, they're going to start to fill in. Just yeah, yeah. It hasn't happened since August. Or at least... Uh, at least any that are 4.0 or greater. Oh, this okay. Is since August. This is since that's August. Amazing. Yeah, it's really pretty amazing. If I keep that for two, three years, which I've done in the past, the plates just jump out at you. There's a few exceptions. There's a few earthquakes in the center of the United States, and that's actually where there are old plates that slip. Um, but uh, the active, they're not active anymore. So to your question, these areas where they move around changes throughout the course of the Earth, and it has to do with those convection currents that come out of the bowels of the Earth. Is this map north to south? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, you bet. Um, yes, it is. So this is 700 million years ago. So Australia's got a whole lot of moving to do. I'm not sure we're going to see all that. Uh, we're, we're really going to focus on this area here because that's what rose our mountains. And the Great Lakes were there? So, uh, no, 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 no great. Time. Yeah, this here is just to, probably terrain. It's to help us, I think, see Laurentia and that we are from Laurentia. Um, so, uh, so that's about 700 million years ago, the first major supercontinent that we know of called Rodinia. And now what's going to happen is it's going to split up. And we are going to see Gondwanda right now, by God. OK. And here it is down here. Boom. Uh, Gondwanda means land of the Gonds. And uh, I'm told that the guy, Dr. Seuss, gave it its name. And I guess the Gonds are a tribe that live in India. I don't really know. I know less about that than I know about geology. Uh, so at any rate, what's happened is these land masses, because of the convection currents that drive them, have separated. 
Once again, here is Laurentia. This is about where we are, still well south of the equator, about where northern Brazil is today, at least based on the equator. We see that most of the land, Gondwana, is way down. One little piece, of, uh, we have a, a big plate here called Baltica. That's going to be real important for us in just a few millions of years. Um, uh, but one other thing I just want to note is that uh, most of eastern New England is down here. Okay, way down attached to Gondwana. And it too is going to become a player in this story as well. That's a great question. I think it's uh, Australia's over here. It's probably back around. Okay. Yeah, down in that way somewhere. It's the first off. It's the first piece that broke off. Yeah, could be. Yeah. Uh, Antarctica broke off pretty early as well. So this here is about 514 million years ago. Biologically, this is at the end of a period of time called the Cambrian Explosion, which for a biologist is just so fascinating because it's where all these organisms, multicellular organisms, start to evolve. The first insects, the first, the first organism that, in fact, at this point in time, we're actually starting to get some primitive fish, uh, some, some things with backbones. Uh, and, and there's all kinds of been wonderful books written about this time. There's one written by a guy named Stephen Jay Gould who was an evolutionary biologist from Harvard. He used to write for natural history called Wonderful Life. And, and it's something I always give my students, my uh, advanced students as an assignment because it's a beautiful illustration of, of biology experimenting. It's like experimental multicellular life. And what happened was most of the experiments failed and they went extinct. And the lucky ones survived, and we are, our great, 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 great granddaddy was in that, and had he gone extinct, we wouldn't be here, okay, which is pretty amazing. And Gould's thesis is an interesting one. He said that if you take the history of life on Earth on a videotape, back it up to this point, let it play again, we get different results. So really cool ideas. So th that's biologically what's going on at this time. And this is about the time that the stones that we're standing on are getting formed. And they're getting formed right in here in what we call the Iapetus Ocean. Okay, so they're living and dying and we're forming limestone and it's actually been forming for quite some time. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a peek at what happens. And what happened was two things. Baltica has approached, once again, riding on convection currents. I mean, we, we talk about it as it just flies across. It moves about three kilometers, uh, wrong, about five kilometers or three miles every million years. Okay, so it's a slow process. So Baltica starts to approach Laurentia. That's where we are. That star is where Connecticut is. Notice we're still below the equator, well below the equator. Avalonia is that part that is eastern New England. It has broken off from Gondwana. It's formed a tiny little subcontinent, and it's moving this way too. And what's happening as Baltica starts to approach Laurentia it's just like a big, huge snow plow, snow plow plowing through a parking lot. And it takes those stones and it starts to heap them up and starts to make a pile and starts to put it into a great big pile. But the other thing that's happening as well, most geologists don't think Baltica and Laurentia hit. Instead, it approached uh, Laurentia went underneath, got subducted, we had volcanoes, and it was that it formed an island of volcanoes, and that's what hit. Either way, doesn't matter, 400 million years ago, uh, it's not going to affect too much of us, but what happened was this. What happened was that Baltica came in, we see the subduction of uh, Laurentia, we see the volcanoes pop in here, and we see that limestone from the Iapetus Ocean, which is now closing. And we see that limestone get pushed up. This is what we call the Taconic Orogeny. And that happened about 400 million years ago. And those are the granddaddies of the mountains that uh, are, well, we'll see that they're the granddaddies of both the Green Mountains and 
the Taconic Mountains. Uh, Avalonia is then going to come in and hit. It's going to keep the squeeze. We're just going to squeeze this area. More rising. These mountains here, the Taconic Mountains, got to about the size of the present day Andes. So they were majestically huge, uh, beautiful things. Uh, this here is a geologic map of Massachusetts. And we see that what we would be up in here. But what we see is we see these layers of rock getting added to Massachusetts in this fashion. That's as the Avalonian plate moved in, pushed rock, and then the Avalonian plate itself joins Laurentia and forms eastern Massachusetts. At this time, there's no Cape Cod. Cape Cod is nothing but a sandbar that came from the glacier. So Cape Cod is pretty darn young, so, uh, but, but it, still, it still has that. Um, now, the next thing, I had some difficulty, had some difficulty, I had a few other maps that come from a wonderful little book here called Written in Stone by a guy named Chet Ramo and his daughter Maureen. And it shows a little bit more in detail of this, this movement together of the plates. And unfortunately, I can't get them to get put up onto the uh, projector for whatever reason. There's a couple missing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back and just try to talk a little bit through this. So, so what happens is this. Baltica moves in. It's going to actually start to pivot this way. Laurentia is going to start to pivot this way. We're going to finally get over the equator. Uh, Avalonia is going to jam on into here, but then what's going to happen is Gondwana is going to move towards us as well. So we have got a couple hundred million years of squeeze coming. And at the end of that time, at the time of 200 million years ago, this is 400, these lands have met. Okay, they have met, and that is Pangaea. And it was that squeeze of all of these continents coming together and smashing into one another that formed Pangaea, but it also gave us our two mountain ranges. And what happened was, as these lands came and hit, rather than rising our mountains up, it caused a horizontal fracture in the earth to occur. It's called a thrust fault. And what happened was that the peaks of the Taconic Mountains basically got pushed off of their original position. And, they, and over the millions of years, they got pushed one kilometer, two kilometers. And, and it really was a little bit more complicated than that. It, it was, here are our Taconics. And here's this land crushing into us. We get this fracture like this. And this entire thing starts to slough off. Sorry. This entire thing here starts to slough off and move this way. And it, when it did, it actually pushed the first piece this way. And then this overrode this, and it came up onto that. And then this overrode that and came up to that. So we actually have an old ridge, a less old ridge, a newer ridge, as we push the peaks off of the surface. And what we end up with, and this is really oversimplified, is we end up with the roots of the Taconic Mountains here, and then the Taconic Mountains over here. And then those, those, those little peaks that run out this way. These are now called the Green Mountains, and this is the Taconic Mountains. So the Taconic Mountains have actually been pushed off these giant green mountains. Again, a little bit of an oversimplification, but not, to not incorrect either. OK, so, so that's what's going to happen as Pangaea forms 200 million years ago. We see the evidence of this all around us if we're lucky and if we're looking. This here's the road cut on Route 279 heading out towards to Troy. And we see that when these hit, the land wrinkled like a rug. And then it eroded away. The tops of it was sanded down by water and weather and certainly the glaciers. And we see this here, which was one time the bottom of a seabed. Okay, 
all flat, getting just deformed and wrinkled. Just the forces are just something I can't even think of. Uh, this is another photograph from there. Um, my guess, and I don't know this for sure, I've been told by this guy here, his name is Niels Jorgensen, he wrote this wonderful little book, oh God, about 50 years ago now. Uh, it's called uh, New England's Landscape. He tells me that you can see this thrust fault, this horizontal crack in Bennington. He's even told me where to go and forget it. Okay, <laughs> not, not I, but I have seen this one. Okay, this here is that thrust fault. This is in Burlington. If you go to North Beach in Burlington and then keep going out to the point, this is called Lone Point, and what we have here is we have old rock that has rid, ridden up, gotten pushed up over younger rock. So it's like we got this and then it gets pushed up like this so that the bottom of this is older than that. And this is a remnant of that thrust fault that pushed the peaks of the Taconics over there and left those over there. When we go out, you take a look at the Taconics, you'll see that they're kind of peaky. But when, when you take a look at the greens, they're going to form this flattish bank. And that's because their peaks are over there now. OK, just amazing. OK, so after that, 200 million years ago, things kind of slow down, a little quiet. Um, and uh, what we're going to start to see now is the seafloor spreading between the African plate and what we've been calling Laurentia, the North American plate, the birth of the Atlantic Ocean. I know less about mythology than I do about geology, but I'm told that Iapetus is the father of Atlas. Anybody know? Okay, good. Well then, Iapetus is the father. Uh, and Iapetus gave birth to Atlas and the Atlantic Ocean is named for Atlas. So where that Iapetus Sea was right here, and we still have that supercontinent down here, Gondwanda, and uh, where the Iapetus Sea was, the rocks of it are, we're walking on them right now, the seafloor spreading and we have the, the sun of Iapetus, the Atlantic forming. And what's happened since then is we've continued to spread that seafloor We've continued to migrate our, our continents, and um, we see, again, 94 million years ago, dinosaurs are still king of the planet. Uh, it looks a little bit like this. We're starting to spread things out. There's no major landmass. Gondwana is falling apart. Uh, uh, Antarctica is heading south. Australia is still joined. It's going to break off. And uh, 50 million years ago, dinosaurs have now gone extinct, and here we are today. So we are spreading out, and this plate is still going that way, and these plates are going that way, and the Pacific is getting narrow by about that much a year. Um, and uh, that's where we are. And the Earth today is very similar to what the Earth was even 100,000 years ago. And it was 100,000 years ago that the Wisconsin Glacier period occurred. And that was the last big force of this area. And uh, this here is Equinox, once again, Cook's Hollow, Skinner's Hollow. Skinner's Hollow most definitely is what we call a glacial cirque, where a big tongue of ice just sat there and hollowed out this beautiful bowl. Cook's Hollow, certainly shaped by the glacier, but more erosional, steeper. And you can actually go out today and just see the erosion. You can see these rocks just waiting to come on down. I know after Irene, I drove up here expecting to see Table Rock down in the valley, uh, and someday. So, but at any rate, we can see here is our mountain today. Here's the glacier. This here, um, it's just a wonderful picture because its, its shape is so similar. And we can see what our mountain looked like uh, during the glacial period. It's not quite correct because the glacier around here would have put the top of the glacier up here somewhere. It was uh, about, it, was, it went over the peak. And uh, that glacial period started about 100,000 years ago. It reached its peak about 20,000 years ago, started to level off, and then about 13,000 years ago, it got warm and it started to melt. And in 3,000 years, 
short amount of time. You know, in 3,000 years, boom, that glacier is gone. And the, uh, the water that must have poured through there, and, and it just it is incredible. At one point, about uh, 12,000 years ago, Vermont and New York looked like this. Uh, the R Connecticut River Valley was completely swollen into a gigantic lake called Lake Hitchcock. We see the Champlain Sea up here, Lake Albany. Uh, uh, our area here, we had uh, apparently a constant dribble of meltwater over into the Hudson River. Okay, there was, it, it dribbled out north of us through what is now the Meadowy River uh, Valley. It, it went down through where Route 313 is, and it snuck down south and entered into what's now the Walloom Sack. But there must have been a big, huge body of water right here. Uh, the Hale Mountain in Shaftesbury is the end of where the glacier was, and it formed like, a, it formed like a, an area where the water slowed down. And as the water came down the mountains and took the soils and then slowed down, it dropped those. And that's one of the reasons why we have such great sand pits down in Shaftesbury, uh, which you can't see too well unless you go up high. And then it is so ugly. You know, these huge gaping wounds in the earth uh, taking, care, taking that. Um, and we continued to, uh, continued to melt. Lots and lots of really cool, interesting things happened. I'll just share one more because uh, we're kind of running out of time. There was a time when the glacier was up there acting as a dam, and I read where it just let go. Boom. And the water level in the Champlain Sea fell three to 400 feet in a couple days. It's just amazing. You can just imagine what that water did. And then what has happened since then is you relieve this land of the glaciers, and believe it or not, they're actually springing up. Those glaciers actually push the land down, and with their removal, they're springing up. And uh, originally, when this, what happened after the meltwater escaped through that catastrophe, is that seawater from here entered into the Champlain Basin, but then the rebounding land just kind of drained that out. Okay, so thank you so much for all your attention, your questions, you guys are terrific. Uh, no, Red Mountain is the Taconic Peak further down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That goes right to West Mountain and Shep Mount Anthony. Okay. So again, you can see the peak nature of the Taconics, and now we can actually see the whole ridge going down to Green, uh, to Red Mountain, and then Grass Mountain off to the right, and Spruce Peak, the furthest one. And then you look over here, and you just got this big block, this big wall. One of the ways that the geologists know this stuff happens is they look at the layers and they look for volcanic ash. And if there's volcanic ash, that means there was a nearby volcano. And that means that the plates were coming together. So that's one of the things that they use to piece this together. And if there's a, a tiny bit of, of ash, then they were far apart. But if there's a lot of ash, then they were pretty close together. And they're able to, to date these, these layers. Look at those beautiful layers of all these uh, just different characteristics based on whatever was living at the time. Okay, when we get crushed, we fracture this way. Mm -hmm. And what really happened was the stuff that's over towards Saratoga was probably right down in there. And it got pushed over there and get pushed up and it forms those little hills and then and then other stuff rides up on top of that and forms another ridge and then so maybe a better way to say it isn't that that's the youngest it was the last formed yeah does that make sense <laughs> thank you yeah yeah thanks for coming i really appreciate it <laughs> Less resistant rock, more resistant. These days. But that's pretty wild.